morning. I'm Chuck Wieger. I serve as the DFL lead for the Senate E-12 Policy and Finance Committee. A top priority and core value for the Senate DFL will always be fully investing in our students and schools, our students, families, teachers, the entire education staff team have faced tremendous challenges during the pandemic. And while many students and staff are now returning to schools, we need to ensure that they return safely during reopening and recovery. It's crucial that we address each student's needs now, especially counseling, coping and catching up. The state has a responsibility now to step up. To accomplish this, resources are needed. We join in supporting Governor Walz's Do North Education Plan to help students and schools recover. We strongly support investing $150 million in one-time money to help students now during this transition. While much of the challenge before us is a result of COVID-19, we also know the pandemic has further exposed and exacerbated existing problems, particularly the opportunity gap. Closing that gap will eventually happen if we invest in programs that work. For example, full service community schools, which provide wraparound services. It works. High quality early education programs, so students are ready for kindergarten. Proven, it will work. Additionally, student success will improve. The opportunity gap closes if we recruit, hire, and retain more teachers of color and American Indian teachers. Our teaching core needs to reflect the diversity of the students in our classrooms. Finally, as students progress and graduate, it's imperative that post-secondary education is affordable. Further, student training needs to be aligned with the needs of our future workforce. We are committed to these programs. They work, they deliver proven results. Invest in our students and schools. Remember, students are our future. Speaking next is Senator Isaacson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Weger. My name is Jason Isaacson, State Senator from the northern suburbs of uh, St. Paul. And let me say that uh, it's been apparent to many folks across the state the additional needs we have when it comes to mental health support for our students and our schools. And not only that, but in this pandemic, those problems have been exasperated and those needs are even more pressing. Minnesota has consistently been at the bottom nationally of the ratio of school counselors to students. The Senate DFL continues to put forward solutions to increase student to counselor ratios for our schools, but those efforts have been blocked by the Senate GOP. Our students deserve better. We must do more to invest in the whole child, which includes supporting their mental health and non-academic needs. Schools want the tools and practices to identify and understand mental health and wellness and ensure students have received appropriate care. However, their critical funding for these efforts are, we need to make sure we're taking care of them. What we see in here is frustration from school leaders across the state about the lack of access to resources and funding to help students deal with mental health issues and promote overall wellness. I hear this in my district when talking to students and parents and teachers. We're definitely not taking care of our kids the way we need to and providing the services they need. And this is especially true for our most vulnerable students. We stand solidly with Governor Walls. His latest budget plan designates $745 million in new state spending on education, from childcare through non-traditional college students. And of that $745 million, $46 million will go to schools hiring necessary support staff to meet students' social, emotional, and physical needs. Every Minnesota student deserves to feel supported and cared for in their schools, and this is a great first step to ensuring our students have the resources and opportunities they need to succeed. I'd like to introduce Amanda Blomstead, Bombstead, excuse me, a school counselor in Mankato and the current president-elect of the Minnesota School Counselors Association to share her thoughts on this. Amanda? Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. Again, my name is Amanda Bombstead and I've been a high school counselor for 16 years. Student mental health has always been a top concern of school counselors and we play an important role in helping students and families navigate the complexities of how to overcome the obstacles that can occur. I would like to walk you through what a day in the life of a school counselor looks like. First, I started the day by facilitating a parent student teacher team meeting to discuss academic concerns due to the student's recent diagnosis of anxiety, depression, and ADHD. We worked together to develop strategies to help the student have greater academic success. 
Next, I met with a student who has regularly scheduled weekly counseling sessions with me. They have recently identified as transgender and the student has just been diagnosed with anxiety. I then met with a new student and their family who is transferring mid quarter due to academic difficulties, along with a diagnosis of PTSD. They also have a 504 plan in place. As part of the meeting, I wanted to learn what successes a student has had, areas of concern, create a schedule, communicate with the teachers about the incoming student, along with the accommodations that need to be implemented with a 504 plan. Next up was the weekly small group counseling um, session that I run with students. They all struggle with stress and anxiety. Each week I facilitate conversations with the students as they go through the curriculum that was developed by myself and our school social worker years ago. I then take a moment to check my email and follow up with a phone call to a parent who has shared that a family member has recently passed away and they are concerned with how their student is handling the loss and grief process. So the parent asks if I can meet with the student weekly to offer support. I then logged into a Zoom meeting with Prairie Care, a local outpatient mental health program in Mankato, as a student of mine is about to exit their six week program due to extreme childhood trauma and put a plan in place to help the student transition back to school successfully and also set up a weekly check-in with that student. Next, I met with a student who is concerned about their parents' alcohol use and is wondering what they can do to help them stop drinking. I listen to the student's concerns, offer resources and connect them with our chemical health counselor. All of this has taken place before noon on a Monday. This schedule is typical for so many school counselors around the state. We are stretched so thin trying to do our very best to support our students and their need for support just continues to grow. We have seen this need grow even more during the pandemic. As school counselors, we encourage the legislature to invest in increased funding to support our students' mental health needs. Our students are counting on us and we will be there, but we need more resources so that we can better meet their needs. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing such important insights about this issue. I really appreciate your time today. Uh, Senator Kunish. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Senator Kunish, I represent District 41. Very pleased to be here with you. I am very pleased with uh, uh, the governor and the attention and the funding that he is putting towards increasing our teachers of color. For the last four years in the House, I've worked hard on um, uh, increasing teachers of color and Indigenous uh, teachers to make sure that our students are, are having the um, educational uh, bonus of having a teacher in the front of the room that looks like them, that speaks their language, that maybe has had the same life experiences as them. And so with that, we are um, again championing the Teacher of Color and Indigenous Act. This is a comprehensive bill that uh, starts with recruiting and attra attracting our teachers or to go on to programs and become full licensed teachers. We're looking for um, the supports and the resources to increase the program com um, um, completion as well as when they're doing their student teaching, which is one of the most complicated times of getting a teaching licensure. And then of course, we wanna make sure that we're keeping those teachers in the schools, that there are support systems there that not only help them get over some of the struggles because we know those first three years are really the hardest ones as, as new teachers adjust to the climate of their school and their administration and their students. I know that when I started teaching 25 years ago, I um, became an, a, a much stronger teacher due to the mentorship of a seasoned teacher, a, a woman who was just about ready to retire. And I got her, her last two years as mentorship. Uh, she's a black woman in North Minneapolis and really and truly had I not had that experience, I think my teaching career might've been very different. So we wanna make sure that we have the resources to provide that kind of uh, mentorship to our, our teachers of color. And then of course, we wanna continue that process. And I'm very encouraged and very heartened by the ability and the interest of the governor to put that funding into uh, his budget to ensure that we're doing that. It's, it's hard to do bits and pieces of this whole comprehensive act. And so hopefully within the legislature as, as well as in partnership with the governor, we will be able to get this passed. We know that our, our students 
are asking for um, this diversity within the, the teaching uh, community and that they appreciate uh, that as well. And so at this point, I would like to um, introduce you to a young woman who is a South High student. And just for, for your information, I have two daughters that were South High students. Uh, Howie um, Emru is here to talk to us and share her experience and uh, aspirations for teaching in classrooms. Howie? Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Howie Emru. I'm a South High 10th grader in Minneapolis. In my previous hometown in Ethiopia, one thing I'll never forget is the way our teachers cared for us as their own children. I was a failing student, but I never felt like a failure because they would build me up with beautiful words and take their time to help me. If we had bad behaviors, they would set us on the right path instead of making us feel like we were born bad and that we didn't deserve a second chance. I came to the US when I was 10. I was rewarded for being nice and respectful because I was quiet. I remember how my teacher targeted my classmate who was black American, spending half an hour of class time talking about how much of a bad kid he was for the way he talked and the way he wore his pants slightly down from his hips. I just stayed quiet because I had not met racism, not yet. In six years of attending school in the US, I have not had many teachers of color. In middle school, I remember my teacher making a racist statement saying to the whole class, white kids are smarter than you because they were born here. This was my second exposure to racism in school. Some students were confused by what he said, and some mentioned that they were born in the US, but he did not apologize nor admit he was wrong. I had respected him. At a young age, I was taught to respect older people because they had wisdom, but he, he was just racist. Unfortunately, my experience and observation are common among my peers. Stories like this continue to happen in schools today and students of color continue to be harmed. We need more teachers like ones from my hometown in Ethiopia who understand firsthand different cultures and who see our potential for all we youth have to offer the world. We need role models in schools who look like us and speak our home languages. You say the future of our world belongs to the youth. Then shouldn't we be treated as such with love and care? If not, how would our future look like? Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, um, Howie. I know uh, transitions like you've had in your lifetime are never easy. And if we can make it better for you, then let's make it better for the future. Thank you again. Uh, Senator uh, Swadzinski, would you like to share your, your views on education with us? Thank you, Senator Kunish. Um, my name is Steve Swadzinski, and I represent um, Eaton Prairie, Minnetonka, and Hopkins Schools. COVID-19 has only exposed what we already knew was true in Minnesota, that we have not kept up with our constitutional responsibility to fully fund our schools and support our students. If we want every student to succeed and receive the high quality education that we have bestowed upon them, regardless of their zip code, we have to provide the funding necessary to do it. Education is one of the biggest areas of our budget. In fact, it's 44% of the Minnesota state state budget. Education, E12, is 44% of the state budget. That's because of the high quality education is a core value of all Minnesotans. In fact, Article 13 of the Minnesota State Constitution states that the stability of a Republican form of government, depending upon the intelligence of the people, it is the duty, it is the duty of the state legislature to create a general and uniform system of public schools. This is the only duty bestowed upon the state legislature in the Minnesota State Constitution to create a general and uniform system of public schools. Unfortunately, the state has been underfunding education for well over a decade, in fact, for almost two decades now. And it is time we start taking the steps in the right direction to support our students to be there for them, to help them discover their purpose in life. This pandemic has brought on so many new challenges. We remain in a public health emergency. And while many of our students are returning to the classroom, we have to make sure that they return safely and that we provide support 
for the critical staff, people like Ms. Bombstead that are there for our students, that provide all the wraparound services to address the learning loss from distant learning that has occurred in the last year. And, let, and yet, let, let's not use the word, it was a lost year because there was a lot of gain this year with a lot of silver linings exposed to us. In fact, one of them being the achievement gap, the vulnerability gap, the opportunity gap, whatever you wanna call it, that's what made this last year what we learned. In addition, we must look at our current students to catch up this summer. We are looking at a variety of programs to support our schools and to support our students in the coming months. When the state fails to keep up its funding commitment to our schools, more and more of the burden falls on local taxpayers and the reliance on school districts to try and pass another referendum. This only creates a patchwork system where students in neighboring districts may have completely different experiences than the neighboring district. These are not a sustainable path toward for ensuring students' success and will create a system of haves and have nots. I remind you, Article 13 says it is our duty to create a general and uniform system of public schools. If we wanna close this gap that has been so exposed in the preceding year, it is our job to create the high quality education that we know our students require for the 21st century. And again, giving them a sense of purpose and why they were born and why they're here and how we can help them leave this world a better place than they found it. And with that said, I turn it over to my colleague, Senator Clausen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Well, I'm Greg Clausen. I'm the minority lead on the Senate Higher Education Committee. And I will be addressing uh, Minnesota workforce uh, development needs. Our education and skilled workforce is one of Minnesota's greatest economic assets. Uh, following World War II and throughout the next several decades, Minnesota had a ready-made workforce. Workers came from the farms and small towns in North and South Dakota, Iowa, and Wisconsin for job opportuni opportunities available in Minnesota. But this is no longer the situation. Minnesota needs to grow its own workforce and quite honestly, this is challenging. Demographics have changed. Midwest states are the slowest growing in population and Minnesota relies heavily on immigrant populations for growth. So what is Minnesota doing about growing our workforce? I have a couple of examples. Uh, first of all, Minnesota is investing and in expanding in workforce development scholarships. We're taking a regional approach, allowing technical colleges to offer scholarships based on worker shortages in their geographic areas as reported by deed job vacancies. Areas of investment are in advanced manufacturing, agricultural, healthcare, services, information technology, early childhood, transportation, and construction. These scholarships are especially needed along our Minnesota borders because other states are experiencing similar trained workforce shortages. One example is in Southwest Minnesota, where we have Northwest Iowa and Sioux Falls, South Dakota. These areas are actively recruiting Minnesota workers with free technical <laughs> education training and jobs. Minnesota businesses cannot afford to lose Minnesota workers. Another example is Governor Wall's budget where he is providing 35 million in workforce stabilization grants to offer tuition free training opportunities for workers impacted by COVID-19. This would come in the form of retaining opportunities uh, for uh, people to retool themselves, re-educate themselves for new job opportunities or also opportunities uh, to complete uh, degrees that have gone left unfinished. The governor's budget proposal also provides expanded emergency assistance for post-secondary students facing temporary financial hardships due to COVID-19, which may threaten a student's ability to stay in school. And this assistance includes funds for food and housing, basic needs that are really important for students to keep on track 
with their education. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to our moderator for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Claussen. At this point, we'll open it up for questions. Please either put it in the chat or um, you can put your virtual hand up and I will call on you. Yes, Shannon, go ahead. Hi, everybody. Uh, Senator Swadzinski, I wonder if you would comment on the proposal by former Supreme Court Justice Alan Page that would put the the idea of ensuring, you know, because you kept quoting Article 13 of Minnesota's Constitution, should more be done in the Constitution to ensure that Minnesota kids have a better access to uh, quality education? You know, I think the Page Amendment, it's a, the good news behind it is it's got us talking about education. So I applaud Kashkari and Page for their efforts in trying to get us to, to put education um, at the forefront of the public debate. Right now, I, I'm leaning towards not being a, the, um, a proponent of the constitutional amendment because it would put the responsibility of education upon the upon the state. And right now, it's the only duty the legislature has. It's the only one. And so if we can't get this duty right, then we failed the students and the teachers and all the critical staff behind them. And so I'd like to make sure we try our hardest as a legislative body to, to perform our only duty under the state constitution before we start turning it over to the executive and judicial branches to play a role. So anyways, thank you for that question, Shannon. Any other questions? Actually, I do have one other. Oh, yes. Shannon. Um, perhaps, uh, Senator Kunish, this one would go to you. But uh, there was, I saw something in the Sahan Journal recently about um, a teacher of color. And I think it, in recent history, she had won, uh, you know, one of the state, you know, teacher of the year awards. And yet she was a younger teacher, a newer teacher. And even though there's not last in, first out necessarily, some districts are still doing that. So as we would recruit more teachers of color and have more teachers of color in the classroom, what about the last in, first out? What about keeping them there as schools, um, you know, reassign teachers or they get laid off? Like, how are you gonna deal with that? Mm -hmm. That's a good question, and that's a question that um, I hear a lot of the time. Uh, uh, within the teachers' union, we do have a system where we um, support our, I call them seasoned educators. It's really a valuable, valuable asset to have those seasoned teachers available as mentors, just as I had, as well as, um, you know, understanding the trends that have gone um, over time. We do need to continue to support them so that they are able to adjust with the times and the changes in our educational system. But at the same time, it is so important that we are bringing new and fresh and energized and um, diverse uh, staff into our schools and especially uh, our teachers of color. Just as you heard from Howie, it makes a difference when you have somebody that understands the struggles or the life um, experiences that you've had in order to excel and and um, do well and feel like part of the community. And so it's, it's fortunate in Minnesota that there are ways that schools and districts can retain new teachers that are showing excellence 
that are um, proving to be an asset to their schools, superintendents or, or, or principals. There are a number of different ways of retaining new vibrant teachers um, if, that, if they so choose. Uh, it's never fun at the end of a school year if you're not tenured to get that pink slip and think, oh man, now I have to go out and find a whole nother job. Fortunately for me, that happened every year for three years. And my principal came back and said, no, we'd like to retain you. I'm going to, you know, find a way to, to continue you here in our school. And so um, I'm just, you know, really glad that, that Pelsby and that um, districts have that, that uh, leeway to be able to retain teachers who do want to be uh, kept in their schools and for those districts to, to keep them as well.